Um, our next speaker is uh, Stephen Friend. Uh, I, I, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Stephen. Um, Stephen actually brought me to Seattle to, to work uh, at an amazing company that uh, he formed and shaped called Rosetta. Um, and he, he moved off to, uh, before he moved off to uh, the East Coast to work for Merck, he joined Jim Watson and approached uh, Stephen Friend, as I've heard, or, sorry, approached Paul Allen, as I've heard uh, in reading Paul's book, which you should read. It's very interesting. Um, and here's Paul. <laughs> Great timing. <laughs> hey, Paul. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. Um, um, and, and really, I think, uh, got the idea going in the early days of, of, of planning the Allen Institute. So um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Stephen here today. He's come back to uh, the, the Pacific Northwest uh, and engaging in something which is very much of a sister organization to the Allen Institute uh, in open sharing data called Sage Bio Networks. Welcome, Stephen. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Sometimes when you're in the midst of a uh, revolution, you don't know it. When we look back on the transition from the Dark Ages uh, to the Renaissance, I think we go, God, there was that day when everyone believed this, and then they uh, shifted. Reality is we're in the middle. We're at a, a cusp of a revolution in terms of how we think of causation in disease, how we think of how things uh, happen, and more importantly, what we could expect from each other in terms of understanding disease. The traditional methods, uh, the traditional uh, heroes that have uh, gotten us to the knowledge base that we have, I think, are, are well understood, appreciated. And the data that has been able to be generated, the way we think we know a disease, has this sheen, has this allure that actually, um, like most optimistic scientists, we almost have it all figured out. And uh, somehow when you diagram it, you get this sense, ah, oh, just maybe it might be off by one uh, notch or, or another notch. The, the, the thing that we would like to do, and I think is a reasonable goal, I don't think it's an audacious uh, goal, maybe audacious, but I think appropriate, um, is what you'd like to know is how you go between one dis uh, normal state and, and, and another disease state. If we can have GPS that allows you to know where you're navigating in a physical space, the question is what would it take to know what those energy minimum barriers are as you move from one state to another in and out, um, whether you have an ebb and flow of a particular disease or um, whether um, you're um, going to um, eventually uh, uh, get into trouble. Here's the problem. I don't think we realize that we're at about the stage that chemists were when they were primarily relying on alchemy. That is, most of our data is stacks, piles, drawers. You can pull out and you can say, here are my facts. But unlike chemistry in the periodic table, unlike physics, the rules that you'd really like to know, the rules that determine how things uh, occur in uh, biomedical space are, are really, I think, as distant uh, to us now. But, but the question then is, if that's the case, if actually what we're missing, and the reason why drug discovery is so inefficient, the reason why we have such a hard time coming up with a, a sort of basic understanding is that we don't have those rules, the question is, how could we get there? Next thing to realize is that actually we sort of sit in this sort of Warhammer game state where most of the resources, unlike, elegantly unlike, the Allen Brain Institute, most of the resources in universities are rather locked up. And you go to one center or you go to one university or one researcher because they have something that another doesn't have. What's happened uh, between the um, turn of the century and, and now is that people are beginning to wake up to the fact that actually there are an awful lot of people who aren't in guilds of experts, who actually could be engaged. And this description of a trillion hours of participatory value per year is something we've been thinking, how do you engage a broader audience for really uh, large tasks? Take ancient generosity, modern digital tools, and look at cognitive score, uh, surplus. I'm going to tell you that there are five things that happened in the last 10 years that it basically are going to break the system as, as it has been uh, built. The first uh, is something you're well aware of. Um, several of the speakers are going to talk about it. And it has to do with not just the DNA, but the entire 
cascade of omics data. The concept that actually we now have enough interdigitating uh, layers that can be integrated of information that actually instead of building associations, you can actually build networks and think about network approaches of disease, not just simply pathways, has been important. As maybe more important is the fact that actually when someone has a discovery, when one has data, now actually anyone in the world can actually uh, get to that instead of having it locked up in one place. I think maybe more important is the concept of having individuals realize that they themselves are able to uh, collect, transmit information that may be of value and that doesn't have to come in the doctor's office, it doesn't have to come in uh, within uh, a hospital complex in order to start streaming data in. And I'll show you uh, a fair amount about this at the end. And then um, uh, lastly, um, in some ways, uh, started up at the University of Washington, uh, David Baker, Zoran Popovich, also Adrian Truel now at Google, this concept, and I will show you examples, of how it is you could take people that normally would have tasks that you would train a postdoc to do, how do you have it so that actually crowds of people can do it, and how often the crowd actually can give a better solution than paying an individual lab to carry out a particular experiment. So there's a discontinuity uh, right now between those um, institutions and the technology. The other thing that I think is worth uh, uh, putting into the mix is that the uh, difference between hypothesis-driven data, what we grew up with, most of us grew up with in biomedicine, um, is shifting over to what the physicists and astrophysicists and other big data scientists have known for some time, which is when you get to data-driven analysis, um, you want to have as many diverse uh, places where the data, the an uh, analysis, and the systems are going on, but you do not want a single set of eyes going on that data. You want as many eyes who are uh, analyzing the data and separating the data analysis uh, from those that are generating it. And so, in the last four years, after having uh, left Merck in uh, 2009, there's a group here in Seattle called Sage BioNetworks, a nonprofit foundation, 40 or so people, who've been basically like a place where you're tinkering, trying alpha testing, outfitter shop, asking what is it that actually we're going to need to live in that next uh, uh, world of research. How can you actually incent people to work in open collaborative ways? What does it take? How do you move beyond the teams of, uh, that are currently going to more teams of teams beyond the current guild of, of experts? I'm going to do a little science, and this is because um, there is a cross-connection uh, personal one between uh, SAGE and uh, Allen Brain Institute. Chris Gaitari, who did this work, is now uh, at, at the Brain Institute. So I just want to show some quick science. So, uh, you get a sense of what you can do. Um, this is uh, work that Chris did in Alzheimer's, uh, work that came out in uh, Cell this past year. But basically, when you have a lot of uh, subjects, you can take co-expression calculated for separate disease in healthy groups and, and organize those into modules, color code them. You can then prioritize those and look at the modules in terms of their expression synchrony. So you can begin to have a hierarchical uh, clustering of those. You can then bring in information about the genetics, inferring uh, in a direct and causal relationships, and build up to a relationship among proteins that are uh, driving this instance uh, microglial activation in Alzheimer's uh, disease that highlighted not the A beta, not the tau process, but instead the incredible centrality of inflammatory processes in driving Alzheimer's. And when you superimpose that on something that sound, looks more familiar, this map is more like a biologic map. What you can see is there are key proteins like tyro BP that Chris and others have shown are actually ones worth going after in Alzheimer's. So that's the type of things you can do when you're aggregating data, getting the analysis by many looking at that. But mostly what I want to uh, talk about is incentives and how do you get, when you have a lot of data and you make it open, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to come and, and work on that. And um, so the project that we did basically said for 400 plus years, communication, recognition, impacts have come off of journal articles. But you know how long it is between that initial insight and when it is that actually someone is able to um, dialogue with you in, the, in that insight. And uh, in the software industry, 
the strategy that people have been using there, um, which is called, uh, one of the big platforms is called GitHub, is that imagine a place where everything that anyone is doing is able to be tracked and followed and have provenance. So that every code change is versioned, every issue is tracked, every project is there, and it allows people to be able to work uh, with each other and, and have some sense of who gave what to whom when. So we built out a software platform called uh, Synapse, and basically it allows private and public, and you can shift back and forth, teams to work on projects. And you, it's a tool that allows you to go in and say, I want these people to work with me. I'm going to pull this forward or, or, or not. So basically, GitHub for, uh, for scientists, because you need to have the big data file sharing. You have to have IRB approvals for the sensitive information. So you can run uh, on any tool. You can move various platforms. You re can, can record that in Synapse. And then you can share with any uh, uh, group that, that you'd like to do. So I want to give two examples of, of uh, Synapse uh, working. This one, which is published uh, today, um, is a project that took us about six or eight months. We found a little over 150 researchers in 20 different institutions that were interested in taking about three petabytes of information that had to do with uh, whole exome sequencing, expression profiling, copy number, RNA, seq, et cetera, data on 12 different tumor types. And each of those uh, groups had been working. I'm working in colon, I'm working here, I'm working there. And the question was, were there certain behaviors, were there certain themes across those different tumor types? And in, for this type of thing to work, and I think Richard, you'll appreciate this uh, well, um, the uh, TCGA did not make the files in a way where you could easily move from this to that. So we ended up curating all the data. We had all of the way that the data was put into the files the code and the models so that anyone could get to anyone else's data, code, and models and start commenting on that. And so for this uh, type of uh, project, what ended up happening is that we found that if you put leaderboards and said, hey, I've just found this, and someone could see, hey, I just did better than this person. If you could take someone's model and someone else could play with it with their data, that it became a very valuable way to sort of move that, that information around. Out of that work, I think there are four papers that are coming out uh, today. There are 14 other in press, and there are four others all coming out in Nature. So this group did all that work on Synapse, showing that they could um, keep track of who was doing what with, with whom. Another group that we've done this with is a series of universities, also with Takeda and Roche, um, with the NIMH, looking at uh, people who had been developing uh, information on schizophrenia. And it's still showing here. Um, so hopefully, and it's showing there. So, um, And so for this community, we did the same thing. We said, let's host all that data on schizophrenia. Let's make it available for anyone. Um, this was information that had to be, was generated from three different uh, human brain regions. There was data on SNP genotypes, on RNA-seq data. But again, the concept was to allow people pre-publication to be working with not just the sharing of data, but the sharing of ideas. That was the key thing, where someone could put out, post a hypothesis, I'm thinking this might, might be valuable. The, beyond the phase two, um, we're bringing in um, individual cell types, um, some uh, more epigenetics, and other ways of, of uh, moving that along. But the thing that actually has moved this project the fastest uh, in terms of how you get people to share is the use of challenges. And so what we found was you can put data out there, but really the question was how do you engage a million eyeballs to look at something that you're interested in? How do you make it so someone's incented? And what we realized is if we could hang out there the fact that the winner would have a publication, okay, all of a sudden all the postdocs start going, hey, I don't need any monetary uh, reward, but if, if I'm getting a first name author paper, that's interesting. So what we did was we set up a way where a problem that we had solved uh, in a first iteration at Rosetta 10 plus years ago, which was can you build predictors for who has aggressive breast cancer? And when we did that work, it turned into Oncotype DX and Mammaprint that many of you are aware of. But we knew those were like rigid uh, classifiers. So we said, let's take 
2,200 women with breast cancer in Canada and Britain. Let's put their clinical and their genomic data up in the cloud. Google helped us host it up in the cloud. And then we set it up so that anyone in the world could come in, work on it. We had hundreds of participants, thousands of models. And what we found was it was an electrical engineer who did data compaction on MP3, living not at the medical school, but the other part of Columbia that no one would talk to, that actually disobeyed all the rules of what we thought you should do for data analysis and basically trumped everyone all the way through the whole thing. And you can go and look this up. So the point is there are people who are not your known experts who are sitting out there able to add insights if you can come up with a way to pull them in, in, into that uh, system. So now we've turned to two new challenges that we're uh, launching in the next two months. One of them is in Alzheimer's. Uh, I don't know where Art Togi is. I've actually never seen him in person. I've been talked to him on the phone a couple of times. There he is. Um, and um, the people who had done this brilliant work, putting together all the in, uh, imaging and cognitive scores in uh, uh, ADNI, we knew it would be nice to actually have many more people who were in sort of active dialogue trying to do some of the decoding of that information. And uh, David Bennett at Ross, uh, with the RossMap data was able to use a validation set. So we've put together a challenge, um, co-led by Robert Green at Harvard, Peter St. John Hislop at uh, University of Toronto in Cambridge, and um, with help from another people, including several people I think, uh, uh, here in, uh, in Seattle. Um, we're looking at um, how you could invite the whole world to come in and look. And again, the prize will be something related to publication. Um, but um, whereas that is good, there's a better uh, a prize, I think, or a better way to incent, and that is uh, impact on patients. So the other challenge that we're running this coming uh, uh, year is one on rheumatoid arthritis. Um, only a third of the patients who have RA actually get benefit from the anti-TNF drugs that get uh, advertised every uh, dinner uh, news uh, programs. And one third, okay? So the question is, who's responding? Who is it? Can we find, can we find those people who shouldn't be getting that drug? Can citizens actually find who should not be getting approved drugs? So what we've done is we've taken 10 clinical trials, four different companies, work in Europe, work in the US, and in Japan, and said, let's pull all the data together. Let's host it up in the cloud where anyone can, can get to that. And in uh, this uh, paper, which is a paper describing the work that's going to come out, Robert Plenge, Laura Mangravit, uh, uh, and uh, Peter St. Uh, Gregerson driving it. We've taken data that comes from citizens and scientists, thrown it up in the cloud. The winner of that challenge, now working with the FDA, because you've got to work with the FDA to do this, will have a validation trial for that winner to see, can we find a set of patients who should not be, re should not be getting those anti-TNF therapies? And as a nonprofit foundation, that puts us in a position to work with the FDA to be able to do that. But where you really wish you could go is all the way out to um, looking at really getting citizens uh, even more involved. And so um, in uh, work that's going to be um, announced, I guess, uh, um, in a public way uh, tomorrow, we've been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to ask, why is it that we can't engage citizens as researchers, funders, uh, uh, patients on particular diseases. This project is called Bridge, but the concept is to basically democratize who can learn what from whom. And I just want to use two projects to give as an example of this. This one is also partially funded by DARPA. So on the smartphones, on the iPhones, uh, there's a microphone. That microphone, as you may know, uh, Max Little and people at the MIT Media Lab found you could collect information from that iPhone that was the equivalent of looking at moderate, severe, um, mild uh, Parkinson's as good as an hour in a, in a neuro lab or in a doctor's office in one minute. So in one minute, talking to the iPhone, you get just as good, 99% uh, sensitivity, 95% specificity. So the project that we're getting ready to do, probably in the UK, is to put out into the hands of 10,000 plus patients with Parkinson's the ability four times a day to actually give recordings of where their disease is, 
put narratives of what's happening to them, and objective information that you could go through and machine learn, look through what's going on. And what we want to do is break the sort of, I think, uh, uh, silly notion that actually the ebb and flow of chronic neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson, ALS, MS, ebb and flow because of the fates. <laughs> Maybe it's actually what we're doing and how we're interacting with the world. And you could actually identify who was happening, was having what happened to them in a way that you can't. And what basically it's about is solving the problem of undersampling. How could you shift from undersampling these diseases? And how could you have the citizens giving more real-time information? The other project is there's an app that came out of uh, Fr France, developed in Paris. 600,000 people are sitting uh, with this app. I think it's 700,000 in Europe. You take it to bed when you're ready to go to sleep. And it has an accelerometer. It has a recording for a microphone. And it actually measures sleep cycles. How long does it take you to go to sleep? What type of sleep are you in? And what we're going to do, oh, I didn't have it on here, sorry. What we're going to do is we're now going to add to that app the following. Hey, how would you like to be in a clinical study and tell me how that, how's that benzodiazepine? How's that Ambien working? So take approved drugs and let citizens start giving information back and see whether there's some types of sleep cycles in which the drugs that you assume work in all may be working in. Most importantly, find is there a set of patients who are not getting any benefit from, from any of those drugs? And so I drew this uh, diagram up at the beginning or showed it uh, in terms of how is it that we're going to navigate, I think, to get to that, we have to think outside the box in terms of who is engaged, how we pay them, who is willing to share what, how do we incent that. And I think the, um, some of the most fun projects are ones that try to peel off the core set and actually integrate it. So I'm not an advocate that actually just uh, random, arbitrary scientists thinking or citizens thinking is actually the solution. I think it's about how do you form a partnership where citizens and patients are treated as equal. Thanks very much. Could you give an actual example of something that you found that would excite me? Um, just, so far, it's just bullshit. It sounds nice, but what have you done? Yeah. So you have to know that uh, when I was a high school student, I called uh, Jim Watson, a high school student, and uh, this is a uh, 71, and he was kind enough to uh, say, after his secretary said, it's not a professor, it's not a postdoc, it's a high school student, uh, come up and talk to me. So I've known uh, uh, Jim for a long time, and uh, when he says the phrase, bullshitting. Right? Really what he's uh, doing is, can, can you tickle my uh, inquisitive nature for hard uh, facts on this? And, 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 and I think that's a, a pro so I think the best example um, that I can give on that was, um, so hard facts, um, the ability to actually find particular proteins that are driving inflammatory processes in the brain. That example that was uh, put in cell, I think, is a reasonable hard example. The concept of how you get, I'm sorry, yeah, um, the um, the um, the example of actually uh, reframing a way to find a classifier for who is getting aggressive uh, breast cancer was not an abstract thing. That allows you to have an ability to make a better choice sure, but for that. What's, what's hmm? the answer? Um, what do you mean, what's the answer? If you have a classifier that allows you to say this patient should get this, this patient should not, you don't necessarily have to go in and find all the way down that it was nf kappa b You can sit there and look and actually make medically impactful uh, decisions um, with, with a way that come off those patterns. And that's, that's a nice thing. It's sometimes important to actually understand all those proteins, those functions. But I think the, the power of some of these patterns and using them uh, to guide uh, therapy or to look is that in so sometimes knowing all the ingredients and the equations gets a little complicated. And so if you can take a shortcut to having an ability to make a clinical decision without knowing everything, sometimes it helps. 
So, so I, I've just written a paper which uh, I hope Lancet won't reject, mm -hmm. which says that the, the reason metformin works on every disease is it prevents inflammation. So that sort of says that the, the heart of the Alzheimer's disease is chronic inflammation. If you stop that, you slow down the course of the disease. I, I think, I don't know if you want to take the microphone, but I think that type of, uh, I hope they uh, take that uh, seriously at Lancet. <laughs> I, I have a pair of quick questions that follow up Jim's first one, I suppose. Um, can you tell us specifically what I think the person's name was Mar Margolin found? So you said somebody was first author and they, they found a trick that nobody else had thought of. Um, and then the second part is how are you going to um, span the bridge between uh, correlation and causation with these kinds of techniques. Uh, can you go back, because th this was, a, uh, so that uh, breast cancer challenge, the electrical engineer was uh, Demetrius, and so was that what you were asking was about the, how, was, how that person got found? I, I, I'm not sure who, who the person was.